Chapter Twenty Two: The Battle for the Ivory Tower. Vigilant scouts returned to camp, reporting that the ivory tower was not far off and could be reached in two, or at the most, three days' marches. But Bastion seemed irresolute. He kept ordering rest stops, but before the troops were half settled, he would make them start out again. No one knew why he was behaving so strangely, and no one dared ask him. Since his great feat at the Star Cloister, he had been unapproachable, even for Zaida. All sorts were conjectures were rifle, but most of the traveling companions were quite willing to obey his contradictory orders. Great wise men, they thought, often strike the common run of people as unpredictable. Atreyu and Falcor were equally at a loss. The incident at the Star Cloister had baffled them completely. Within Bastion, two feelings were at war, and he was unable to silence either one. He longed to meet Moonchild. Now that he was famous and admired throughout Fantasia, he could approach her as an equal. But at the same time, he was afraid she would ask him to return Orin to her. And what then? Would she try to send him back to the world he had almost forgotten? He didn't want to go back, and he wanted to keep the gem. But then he had another idea. Was it so certain that she wanted it back? Maybe she would let him have it as long as he wished. Maybe she had made him a present of it, and it was his for good. At such moments, he could hardly wait to see her again. He rushed the caravan on, but then, assailed by doubts, he would order a stop and think it all over again. After alternating forced marches and prolonged delays, the procession finally reached the edge of the famous labyrinth, the immense flower garden with its winding avenues and pathways. On the horizon, the ivory tower gleamed white against the gold shimmering evening sky. Awed by the splendor and beauty of the sight, the army of Fantasians stood silent, and so did Bastion. Even Zaida's face showed a look of wonderment which had never been seen before and which soon vanished. Atreyu and Falcor, who were in the rear of the procession, remembered how different the labyrinth had looked the last time they had seen it, wasted with the ravages of the nothing. Now it was greener and more flourishing than ever before. Bastion decided to go no further that day, and the tents were pitched for the night. He sent out messengers to bring greetings to Moonchild and let her know that he would be arriving at the ivory tower next day. Then he lay down in his tent and tried to sleep. He tossed and turned on his cushions. His worries left him no peace, but he was far from suspecting that this would be his worst night since coming to Fantasia. Toward midnight, soon after falling into a restless sleep, he was awakened by excited whisperings outside his tent. He got up and went out. What's going on? he asked sternly. This messenger, replied Ilwan the blue djinn, claims he is bringing you news so important that it can't wait until tomorrow. The messenger, whom Ilwan had picked up by the collar, was a nimbly, a creature bearing a certain resemblance to a rabbit, except that its coat was of bright colored feathers instead of fur. Nimblies are among the swiftest runners in Fantasia and can cover enormous distances with incredible speed. When running, they become almost invisible except for the trail of dust clouds that they leave behind. That is why the Nimbly had been chosen as messenger. After running to the ivory tower and back in next to no time, he was desperately out of breath when the djinn set him down in front of Bastion. Forgive me, sire, he said, bowing and panting. Forgive me if I make so bold as to disturb your rest, but you would have every reason to be displeased with me if I failed to do so. Moonchild is not in the ivory tower. She has not been there for a long, long time, and no one knows where she is. Suddenly, Bastion felt cold and empty inside. You must be mistaken. That can't be. The other messengers will tell you the same thing when they get back, sire. After a long silence, Bastion said tonelessly, Thank you, dismissed. He went back into his tent, sat down on his bed, and buried his head in his hands. This seemed impossible. Moonchild must have known he was on his way to her. Could it be that she didn't want to see him again? Or had something happened to her? No, how could anything happen to her in her own realm? But the fact remained... She was gone, which meant that he didn't have to return Orin to her. 
At the same time, he felt bitterly disappointed that he wouldn't be seeing her again. Whatever her reasons may have been, he found her behavior unbelievable. No, insulting. Then he remembered what Falcor and Atreyu had told him, that no one could meet the childlike empress more than once. The thought made him so unhappy that he suddenly longed for Atreyu and Falcor. He needed someone to talk to, to confide in. Then he had an idea. If he put on the belt Gimel and made himself invisible, he would enjoy their comforting presence without mentioning the humiliation he felt. He opened the ornate casket, took out the belt, and put it on. Then, after waiting until he had got used to the unpleasant sensation of not seeing himself, he went out and wandered about the tent city in search of Atreyu and Falcor. Wherever he went, he heard excited whispers. Figures darted from tent to tent here and there. Several creatures were huddled together, talking and, ge and gesticulating. But by then, the other messengers had returned, and the news that Moonchild was not in the ivory tower had spread like wildfire. Atreyu and Falcor were under a flowering rosemary tree at the very edge of the camp. Atreyu was sitting with his arms folded, looking fixedly in the direction of the ivory tower. The luck dragon lay beside him with his great head on the ground. That was my last hope, said Atreyu. I thought she might make an exception for him and let him return the amulet. Now all is lost. She must know what she's doing, said Falcor. At that moment, Bastion located them and sat down invisibly nearby. Is it certain, Atreyu murmured, he mustn't be allowed to keep Orin. What will you do? Falcor asked. He won't give it up of his own free will. Then I'll have to take it from him, said Atreyu. At those words, Bastion felt the ground sinking from under him. That won't be easy, he heard Falcor saying, but if you do take it, I trust that he won't be able to get it back. That's not so sure, said Atreyu. He'll still have his great strength and his magic sword. But the gem would protect you, said Falcor, even against him. No, said Atreyu, I don't think so, not against him. And to think, said Falcor with a grim laugh, that he himself offered it to you on your first night in Amarganth. Atreyu nodded. I didn't realize then what would happen. How are you going to take it from him? Falcor asked. I'll have to steal it, said Atreyu. Falcor's head shot up. With glowing ruby-red eyes, he stared at Atreyu, who hung his head and repeated in an undertone, I'll have to. There's no other way. After a long silence, Falcor asked, When? It will have to be tonight. Tomorrow may be too late. Bastion had heard enough. Slowly he crept away. His only feeling was one of cold emptiness. Everything was indifferent to him now, just as Zaida had said. He went back to his tent and took off the belt Gamal. Then he bade Ilwan bring him the three knights, Hisbald, Hikrian, and Hidorn. As he paced the ground waiting, it came to him that Zaida had foreseen it all. He hadn't wanted to believe her, but now he was obliged to. Zaida, he now realized, was sincerely devoted to him. She was his only true friend. But there was still room for doubt. Perhaps Atreya wouldn't actually carry out his plan. Maybe he had already repented. In that case, Bastion wouldn't ever mention it, though friendship now meant nothing to him. That was over and done with. When the three knights appeared, he told them he had reason to believe that a thief would come to his tent that night. When they agreed to keep watch and lay hands on the thief, whoever he might be, he went to Zaida's coral litter. She lay sound asleep, attended by her five giants in their black armor, who stood motionless on guard. In the darkness, they looked like five boulders. I wish you to obey me, Bastion said softly. Instantly, all five turned their black iron faces toward him. Command us, master of our mistress, said one in a metallic voice. Do you think you can handle Falcor the Luck Dragon? Bastion asked. That depends on the will that guides us, said the metallic voice. It is my will, said Bastion. Then there is no one we cannot handle, was the answer. Good, then go close to where he is, he pointed. That way, 
As soon as Atreyu leaves him, take him prisoner, but keep him there. I'll have you called when I want you. Master of our mistress, the metallic voice replied, it shall be done. The five black giants marched off in step. Zaida smiled in her sleep. Bastion went back to his tent, but once in sight of it, he hesitated. If Atreyu should really attempt to steal the gem, he didn't want to be there when they seized him. He sat down under a tree nearby and waited, wrapped in his silver mantle. Slowly the time passed. The sky paled in the east. It would soon be morning. Bastion was beginning to hope that Atreyu had abandoned his project when suddenly he heard a tumult in his tent. And a moment later, Hikrian led Atreyu out with his arms chained behind his back. The two other knights followed. Bastion dragged himself to his feet and stood leaning against the tree. So he's actually done it, he muttered to himself. Then he went to his tent. He couldn't bear to look at Atreyu, and Atreyu too kept his eyes to the ground. Ill one, said Bastion to the blue djinn. Wake the whole camp. I want everyone here and tell the black giants to bring Falcor. The djinn hurried off with the rasping cry of an eagle. Wherever he went, the denizens of the tents, large and small, began to stir. He didn't defend himself at all, said Hikrian with a movement of his head toward Atreyu, who was standing there motionless with eyes downcast. Bastion turned away and sat down on a stone. By the time the five armored giants appeared with Falcor, a large crowd had gathered. At the approach of the stamping metallic steps, the crowd opened up a passage, Falcor was not chained, and the armed guards were not holding him, but merely marching to the left and right of him with drawn swords. He offered no resistance, master of our mistress, said one of the metallic voices. Falcor laid down on the ground at Atreyu's feet and closed his eyes. A long silence followed. Creatures poured in from the camp and craned their necks to see what was going on. Only Zaida was absent. Little by little, the whispering died down. All eyes shuttled back and forth between Bastion and Atreyu, who stood motionless, looking like stone statues in the gray morning light. At length, Bastion spoke. Atreyu, he said, you tried to steal Moonchild's amulet and take it for yourself. And you, Falcor, were an accomplice to his plan. Not only have you both been untrue to your old friendship, you have also been guilty of disobedience to Moonchild, who gave me the gem. Do you confess your wrong? Atreyu cast a long glance at Bastion, then he nodded. Bastion's voice failed him. It was some time before he could go on. I have not forgotten, Atreyu, that it was you who brought me to Moonchild. I have not forgotten Falcor's singing in Amarganth, so I will spare your lives, the lives of a thief and of a thief's accomplice. Do what you will. Just so you go away, the further, the better, and never let me lay eyes on you again. I banish you forever. I have never known you. He bade Hikrion remove Atreyu's chains. Then he turned away. Atreyu stood motionless for a long while. Then he cast another glance at Bastion. It looked as if he wanted to say something, but changed his mind. He bent down to Falcor and whispered something in his ear. The luck dragon opened his eyes and sat up. Atreyu jumped on his back and Falcor rose into the air. He flew straight into the brightening morning sky and though his movements were heavy and sluggish, he soon vanished in the distance. Bastion went to his tent and threw himself down on his bed. At last you have achieved true greatness, said a soft voice. Now you've stopped caring for anything. Now nothing can move you. Bastion sat up. It was Zaida. She was squatting in the dark, the darkest corner of the tent. You, said Bastion, how did you get in? Zaida smiled. Oh, my lord and master, no guards can shut me out. Only your command can do that. Do you wish to send me away? Bastion lay back and closed his eyes. After a while, he muttered, It's all the same to me. Go or stay. For a long while, she watched him from under her half-lowered lids. Then she asked, What are you thinking about, my lord and master? Bastion turned away and did not reply. It was plain to Zaida that this was no time to leave him to himself. In such a mood, he was capable of slipping away from her. 
she must comfort him and cheer him up in her own way, for she was determined to hold him to the course she had planned for him and for herself, and she knew that in the present juncture no magical belts or tricks would suffice. It would take stronger medicine, the strongest medicine available to her, namely Bastion's secret wishes. She sat down beside him and whispered in his ear, When, O lord and master, will you go to the ivory tower? I don't know, said Bastion. What can I do there if Moonchild is gone? You could go and wait for her. Bastion turned to face Saida. Do you think she'll be back? He had to repeat his question more insistently before Zaida replied, No, I don't believe so. I believe she has had to leave Fantasia forever, and that you, my lord and master, are her successor. Slowly, Bastion sat up and looked into Zaida's red and green eyes. It was some time before he grasped the full meaning of her words. I? he gasped, and his cheeks broke out in red spots. Do you find the idea so frightening? Saida whispered. She gave you the emblem of her power. Now she has left you her empire. Now, my lord and master, you will be the childlike emperor. It is only your right. You not only saved Fantasia by your coming, you also created it. All of us, I too, are your creatures. Why should you, the great knower, fear to take the power that is rightfully yours? Bastion's eyes glowed with a cold fever. And then Zaida spoke to him of a new Fantasia, a world molded in every detail to Bastion's taste, where he could create and destroy just as he pleased, where every creature, good or bad, beautiful or ugly, wise or foolish, would be the product of his will alone, and he would reign supreme and inscrutable, playing an everlasting game with the destinies of his subjects. Then alone, she concluded, will you be truly free, free from all obstacles, free to do as you please. Weren't you trying to find out what you really and truly want? Well, now you know. That same morning they broke camp, and led by Bastion and Zaida in the coral litter, the great procession set out for the ivory tower. A well-nigh endless column moved along the twining paths of the labyrinth. In the late afternoon, when the head of the column reached the ivory tower, the last stragglers had barely entered the great flowering maze. Bastion could not have wished for a more festive reception. On every roof and battlement stood elves with gleaming trumpets blaring away at the top of their lungs. The jugglers juggled, the astrologers proclaimed Bastion's greatness and good fortune, the bakers baked cakes as big as mountains, the ministers and counselors escorted the coral litter through the teeming crowd on the high street, which wound in an ever-narrowing spiral up the conical tower to the great gate leading into the palace. Followed by Zaida and the dignitaries, Bastion climbed the snow-white steps of the broad stairway, traversed halls and corridors, passed through a second gate, through a garden full of ivory animals, trees and flowers, mounted higher and higher, crossed a bridge and passed through the last gate. He was heading for the Magnolia Pavilion at the very top of the tower. But the blossom was closed, and the last stretch of the way was so steep and smooth that no one could climb it. Bastion remembered that the wounded Atreyu had not been able to climb that slope, not by his own strength at least, because no one who has ever reached the Magnolia Pavilion can say how he got there, for this victory must come as a gift. But Bastion was not Atreyu. If anyone was now entitled to bestow the gift of this victory, it was he and he had no intention of letting anything stop him. "'Bring workmen,' he commanded. "'I want them to cut steps in this smooth surface. "'I wish to make my residence up there.' "'Sire,' one of the oldest counsellors ventured to object, "'that is where our golden-eyed commander of wishes lives when she is here.' "'Do as you're told!' Bastion roared at him. "'The dignitaries turned pale and shrank back from him, but they obeyed. Workmen arrived with mallets and chisels, but try as they might, they couldn't so much as chip the smooth surface of the dome. The chisels leapt from their hands without leaving the slightest dent. Think of something else, said Bastion angrily. My patience is wearing thin. Then he turned away, and while waiting for the Magnolia Pavilion to be made accessible, 
He and his retinue, consisting chiefly of Zaida, the three knights, Hisbald, Hikrin, and Hidorn, and Ilwan, the blue djinn, took possession of the remaining rooms of the palace. That same night, he summoned all the ministers and counselors who had served Moonchild to a meeting in the large circular hall where the Congress of Physicians had once met. There he informed them that the golden-eyed commander of wishes had left him, Bastion Balthasar Bucks, power over the endless Fantasian Empire, and that he was now taking her place. In conclusion, he demanded perfect obedience. Even, or I might say especially, he added, when my decisions are beyond your understanding, for I am not of your kind. He then announced that in exactly 77 days he would crown himself childlike emperor of Fantasia, and that the event would be celebrated with such splendor that it would outshine anything ever done in Fantasia. And he ordered the counselors to send messengers forthwith to every part of the realm, for he wished every nation of the Fantasian Empire to be represented at his coronation. Thereupon Bastion withdrew, leaving the counselors and other dignitaries alone with their bewilderment. They didn't know what to do. What they had heard sounded so monstrous that for a long while they could only stand there silently, hanging their heads. Then they began to deliberate, and after many hours they came to the conclusion that they would have to obey Bastion's commands, for he bore the emblem of the childlike empress, and then that, that, that entitled him to obedience, regardless of whether Moonchild had really abdicated in his favor, or whether this was just another of her unfathomable decisions. And so the messengers were sent, and all Bastion's orders were carried out. He himself took no further interest in the coronation, but left all the details to Zaida, who kept the whole court so busy that hardly anyone had time to think. During the next days and weeks, Bastion spent most of his time in the room he had chosen, staring into space and doing nothing. He would have liked to wish for something or make up a story to amuse himself, but nothing occurred to him. He felt hollow and empty. At length, he hit on the idea of wishing for Moonchild to come to him. If he was really all-powerful, if all his wishes came true, she would have to obey him. For whole nights he sat there whispering, Moonchild, come. You must come. I command you to come. He thought of her glance, which had lain in his heart like a glittering treasure. But she did not come, and the more he tried to make her come, the fainter became his memory of that glitter in his heart, until in, in the end all was darkness within him. He convinced himself that everything would come right again if only he could be in the Magnolia Pavilion. Time and again he went up to the workmen and tried to spur them with promises or threats, but all to no avail. Ladders broke, nails bent, chisels split. Hikrion, Hisbald, and Hidorn with whom Bastion would gladly have chatted or played games, were as good as useless. In the deepest cellar of the ivory tower they discovered wine. There they sat day and night, drinking, playing dice, bellowing silly songs, or quarreling, and as often as not attacking, attacking one another with their swords. Sometimes they staggered up and down the high street, molesting the fairies, elves, and other female denizens of the tower. "'What do you expect, sire?' they said when Bastion found fault with them. "'You must give us something to do!' But Bastion couldn't think of anything and bade them wait until his coronation, though he himself couldn't have said what difference that would make. Little by little, the weather changed for the worse. Sunsets of liquid gold became more infrequent. Almost always the sky was grey and overcast. Not a breeze stirred. The air grew sultry and lifeless.' The day appointed for the coronation was near. The messengers returned. Some brought delegates from remote corners of Fantasia, but others arrived empty-handed for many of the nations refused, out of hand, to be represented at the ceremony. And in some countries there had been veiled or open rebellion. Bastion stared into space. Once you are emperor, said Zaida, you will put the house in order. I want them to want what I want, said Bastion. But already Zaida had hurried off to make new arrangements. And then came the day of the coronation that did not take place. It went down in the history of Fantasia as the day of the bloody battle for the ivory tower. There was no dawn that morning. The sky was too covered with thick, leaden-gray clouds. The air was almost too heavy to breathe. 
working hand in hand with the Ivory Tower's 14 Masters of Ceremony, Zaida had drawn up an elaborate program for the celebration. Beginning early in the morning, bands on all the streets and squares played music such as had never been heard in the Ivory Tower. Strident yet monotonous, none who heard it could help jiggling his feet and dancing. The musicians wore black masks. No one knew who they were or where Zaida had found them. Every roof and house front was decorated with bright colored flags and pennants, but they hung sadly limp, for there was no wind. Along the high street and on the wall around the palace, hundreds of pictures had been set up, ranging in size from small to enormous, and all showed the same face, bastions. Since the Magnolia Pavilion was still inaccessible, Zaida had prepared another site for the coronation. The throne was to be installed at the foot of the ivory steps near the palace gate where the winding high street ended. Thousands of golden censers were smoldering, and the smoke, with its lulling yet exciting fragrance, drifted slowly up the steps and down the high street, finding its way into every last nook and cranny. The armored giants were everywhere. Only Zaida knew how she had managed to multiply the five she had left into such an army. And as if that were not enough, Fifty of them were mounted on gigantic horses, which were also made of black metal and moved in perfect unison. The armored horsemen escorted a throne up the high street in a triumphal procession. It was as big as a church door and consisted entirely of mirrors of every size and shape. Only the cushion on the seat was covered with copper-colored silk. Strangely, this enormous glittering object glided up the spiral street unaided without being pushed or pulled, it seemed to have a life of its own. When it stopped at the great ivory gate, Bastion stepped out of the palace and sat down on it. In the midst of all that glitter and splendor, he looked like a tiny doll. The crowd of onlookers who were held back by a cordon of armored giants burst into cheers, but for some inexplicable reason, their cheers sounded thin and shrill. Then began the most tedious and wearisome part of the ceremony, the messengers and delegates from all over the Fantasian Empire had to form a line which extended from the mirror throne down the entire spiraling high street and deep into the labyrinthine garden. Every single delegate, when his turn came, had to bow down before the throne, touch the ground three times with his forehead, kiss Bastion's right foot and say, In the name of my nation and my species, I beseech you, to whom we all owe our existence, to crown yourself childlike emperor of Fantasia. This had been going on for two or three hours when a sudden tremor passed through the crowd. A young fawn came dashing up the high street, reeled with exhaustion, pulled himself together, ran till he reached Bastion and threw himself on the ground, gasping for breath. Bastion bent down to him. How dare you interrupt this august ceremony? War, sire, cried the fawn. Atreyu has gathered a host of rebels and is on his way here with three armies. They demand that you give up Orin. If you will not, they mean to take it by force. The rousing music and the shrill cries of jubilation gave way to a deathly silence. Bastion turned pale. Then the three knights, Hisbald, Hikrian, and Hidorn, appeared on the run. They seemed to be in a remarkably good humor. At last, there's something for us to do, sire, all three cried at once. Leave it to us. Just get on with your celebration. We'll round up a few good men and get after those rebels. We'll teach them a lesson they won't forget so soon. Among the thousands of creatures present, quite a few were utterly useless for military purposes, but most were able to handle some weapon or to fight with their teeth or claws. All these gathered around the three knights who led their army away. Bastion remained behind with the not-so-martial multitude to complete the ceremony, but his heart was no longer in it. Time and again, his eyes veered toward the horizon which he could see from his throne. Great clouds of dust showed him that Atreyu's army was no joke. Don't worry, said Zaida, who had stepped up to Bastion. My armored giants haven't begun to fight yet, They'll defend your ivory tower. No one can stand up to them except for you and your sword. A few hours later, the first battle reports came in. Atreyu had enlisted almost all the greenskins, at least 200 centaurs, 850 rock chewers, 
five luck dragons led by Falcor, who kept attacking from the air, a squadron of giant eagles who had flown from the mountains of destiny, and innumerable other creatures, even a sprinkling of unicorns. Though far inferior in numbers to the troops led by the knights Hikrian, Hisbald, and Hidorn, Atreus' army fought so vigorously that they were soon approaching the ivory tower. Bastion wanted to go out and lead his army in person, but Zaida advised against it. O oh lord and master, she said, it is unseemly for the emperor of Fantasia to take up arms. Leave that to your faithful subjects. All day the battle raged. The entire labyrinth became a trampled, blood-soaked battlefield. By late afternoon, despite the stubborn resistance of Bastion's army, the rebels had reached the foot of the ivory tower. Then, Zaida sent in her armored giants, both mounted and on foot, and they wrought havoc among Atreus' followers. A detailed account of the battle for the ivory tower would take us too far. To this day, Fantasians sing countless songs and tell innumerable stories about that day and night, for everyone who took part saw it in his own way. Certain of the stories have it that Atreus' army included several white magicians who had the power to oppose Zaida's black magic. Of this, we have no certain knowledge, but that would explain how, in spite of the armored giants, Atreyu and his followers were able to take the ivory tower. But there is another, more likely explanation. Atreyu was fighting not for himself, but for his friend, whom he was trying to save by defeating him. The night of the battle was starless, full of smoke and flames. Fallen torches, overturned censers, and shattered lamps had set the tower on fire in many places. The fighters cast eerie shadows. Weapons clashed and battle shouts resounded. Everywhere, through the flames and the darkness, Bastion searched for Atreyu. Atreyu! he shouted. Atreyu, show yourself! Stand up and fight! Where are you? But the sword Seconda didn't budge from its sheath. Bastion ran from room to room of the palace, then out on the great wall, which at that point was as wide as a street. He was heading for the outer gate where the mirror throne stood, now shattered into a thousand pieces, when he saw Atreyu, sword in hand, coming toward him. They stood face to face, and still Seconda did not budge. Atreyu put the tip of his sword on Bastion's chest. Give me the amulet, he said, for your own sake. Traitor, cried Bastion. You are my creature. I created the whole lot of you, including you. So how can you rebel against me? Kneel down and beg forgiveness. You are mad, cried Atreyu. You didn't create anything. You owe everything to Moonchild. Give me Orin. Take it if you can. Atreyu hesitated. Bastion, he said, why do you force me to defeat you in order to save you? Bastion tugged at the hilt of his sword. He tugged with all his might and finally managed to draw Seconda from its sheath. But it did not leap into his hand of its own accord, and at the same moment a sound was heard, a sound so terrible that even the warriors on the high street outside the gate stood as though frozen to the spot, looking up at the two adversaries. Bastion recognized that sound. It was the hideous cracking and grinding he had heard when Grogrimmon turned to stone. Seconda's light went out. And then Bastion remembered how the lion had predicted what would happen if someone were to draw the sword of his own will. But by then, it was too late to turn back. Atreyu tried to defend himself with his own sword, but wielded by Bastion, Seconda cut, in, cut it in two and struck Atreyu in the chest. Blood spurted from a gaping wound. Atreyu staggered back and toppled from the wall. But at that moment, a white flame shot through the swirling smoke, caught Atreyu in his fall, and carried him away. The white flame was Falcor the Luck Dragon. Bastion wiped the sweat from his brow with his mantle and saw that its silver had turned black, as black as the night. Still, with the sword Seconda in hand... He left the wall and went down to the palace courtyard. With Bastion's victory over Atreyu, the fortunes of war shifted. 
The rebel army, which had seemed sure of victory a moment before, took flight. Bastion felt as if he were caught in a terrible dream and could not wake up. His victory left him with a bitter taste in his mouth, but at the same time he felt wildly triumphant. Wrapped in his black mantle, clutching the bloody sword, he passed slowly down the high street. The ivory tower was blazing like an enormous torch. Hardly aware of the roaring flames, Bastion went on till he reached the foot of the tower. There he found the remnants of his army waiting for him in the, des in the, in the desertated labyrinth devastated labyrinth, now a far-flung battlefield strewn with the corpses of Phantasians. Hikrion, Hisbald, and Hidorn were there too, the last two seriously wounded. Ilwan, the blue djinn, was dead. Zaida, holding the belt Gemel, was standing beside his corpse. He saved this for you, O lord and master, she said. Bastion took the belt folded it up and put it in his pocket. Slowly, he passed his eyes over his companions. Only a few hundred were left. More dead than alive, they looked like a conclave of ghosts in the flickering light of the fires. All had their faces turned toward the ivory tower, which was collapsing piece by piece. The Magnolia Pavilion at the top flared, its petals opened wide, and one could see that it was empty. Then it, too was engulfed by the flames. Bastion pointed his sword at the heap of flaming ruins and his voice cracked as he declared, This is Atreus' doing! For this I will pursue him to the ends of the world! Hoisting himself up on one of the gigantic metal horses, he cried, Follow me! The horse reared, but he bent it to his will and galloped off into the night.